Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on HVAC and air quality, brought to you by Plant Services and Kaiser Compressors Incorporated. I'm Tom Welk, Chief Editor of Plant Services, and I'd like to express my appreciation to you for joining us today. This webinar is sponsored by Kaiser, a family-owned company. Kaiser Compressors is one of the world's leading manufacturers and providers of compressed air products and services. Before I introduce our speakers for today, there are a few housekeeping issues that I'd like to review with you. On your screen, you should see several primary sections. The upper left, or audio control section, allows you to adjust the volume of the presentation. Just hover over that section with your cursor until you see the audio volume control, and then adjust it to your preference. To the right, in the largest section, is where today's presentation slides will be displayed. Under that slide window, you'll see a chat section, and this is where you can chat live with fellow audience members. To the left of the slide window is the Ask a Question box, and this is where you can type a question for the presenters at any time during today's webinar. We'll get, as many, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can during a live Q&A session following the presentation, and for those questions that we don't get to during the live Q&A, or for those of you who'd like to enter a question who are listening on demand, uh, the presenters can take up those questions with you offline via email. So if you have a question, please do ask it. Also, please note there's a handout section at the bottom left. And that handout section contains a link to the full set of today's speaker slides, plus an article published in the May 2020 issue of Plant Services by Kaiser's Michael, Michael Camber. And it's titled, Too Big to Succeed, Is Excess Capacity Dragging Down at the Performance of Your Compressed Air System? Here's how to right size. Finally, at the bottom of your screen, you should see icons for additional features. By hovering over each icon, information about it will be displayed. If you have any technical problems like volume or slide windows, please type in those questions also in the Ask a, in the ask a Question box. And one of our technical engineers will assist you directly. If you need a better view of any of the windows, especially the slide window, you can enlarge those sections by clicking on the box in the top right corner of the section next to the X. If you accidentally close out any section from handouts to slide window, you can give them back by clicking the restore icon at the bottom of the screen. It's the leftmost icon in the shape of an arrow in a circle. This webinar will be archived and we encourage you to direct coworkers to the recorded presentation. And at the end of today's presentation, we'll ask you to complete a very brief survey to provide feedback that we can use to improve future webinars. And now I'd like to welcome Neil Melchrunner and Vinner Rauer, who will speak on the topic of oversizing, a widespread compressed air problem that is costing you time and money. Neil is the engin is engineering manager for Kaiser Compressors. He is an authority on compressed air assessments and has conducted and supervised thousands of industrial compressed air studies, helping users achieve significant energy savings and operational improvements. Werner is a product manager for oil injected and oil free screw compressors at Kaiser Compressors Incorporated, and he is also an active leader in the Compressed Air and Gas Institute. Werner helped develop the widely used KGI compressor performance data sheets, and he supported the development and implementation of ISO 11011 and EA4, the new generation of compressed air energy audit standards. Neil and Werner, welcome, and thank you very much for presenting today. Great. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to Plant Services for hosting our webinar today, and uh, also for all of you folks who dialed in. Today's topic, oversized system, but more specifically, how it applies to compressed air stations and how it might be affecting you. Um, I'm actually really excited to be working with Werner on this one, and uh, I think we've got a great webinar planned today. Oversized. We're going to talk specifically how it happens how to identify these systems, what problems could arise, how we can improve them, and we'll also cover a copious amount of real-life examples, which really is my favorite part of the whole presentation. Finally, we'll discuss some design best practices for planning any changes to your compressed air station. It's a lot to cover, so without further ado, just how pervasive is oversized compressed air. With almost 10,000 audits and exponentially more customer visits, 
we've identified that the average compressed air station uses only 44% of its peak capacity. It's a lot of capacity left on the table. This is across all industries and all application types. Sure, when we talk about problems with a compressed air system, we don't normally talk about the elephant in the room. We focus on the staples, controls, storage, piping, pressure problems in the plant. All of these can affect system efficiency. The biggest low-hanging fruit in a compressed air station is typically leaks, and we'll see that in one of my favorite graphics later on. However, oversized systems are out there in more prevalence than we acknowledge, hiding in plain sight. So how does oversized fit in with compressed air? We're all familiar with the term oversized. Simply put, it's having more supply available than necessary, in our case, demand or, or demand flow. Translated into our practical example here, Werner and I are probably not going to order all these pancakes for breakfast when we go to Cracker Barrel, but if we did, we probably would never be able to finish it and they'd have to roll us out. So, you know, basically only order what you think you're going to need. When it comes to compressed air, it may not be apparent that your compressor or your compressors are oversized. And there are many ways you can tell, but a quick check of these items listed here can give you a really good indication if your system is oversized or not. I'm going to hand it over to Werner, and he's going to cover the first topic, which is duty cycle. Okay, thank you, Neil. In, uh, in our quest here today to make people aware of the oversizing issue, let's start with a quick reminder on how a compressor should be applied properly. It's fully loaded when needed and off when not needed. These first two seem quite obvious, but one has to realize that a 100 horsepower compressor, for an example, it's not like a light switch that you can turn on and off willy-nilly. So that's where the dedicated trim or part load solutions come in, uh, which could consist of one or more dedicated trim compressors in smaller sizes or a variable frequency drive compressor that covers the entire required trim flow range. As you guessed it, a single compressor system has to be your trim or part load solution as there is no other compressor to share. Modern compressor controllers, along with proper system design, can make that a good solution for both variable speed drive or fixed speed compressors. With multiple compressor stations, and that can start with just two or three, a master controller has to be part of the solution as somebody needs to do the proper compressor selection while nobody is around. Its most challenging job is to turn compressors off. So duty cycle. For compressors, it's referring to motor running hours over compressor load hours during a specific time period in percent. So a 50% duty cycle would mean that over that time period, which could be a day, a week, or just a weekend, the compressor is running loaded half the time, and the other half is in idle or unloaded mode, where the motor would be running, accumulating service hours, but making no compressed air. In that bottom graph, we just show how load idling and stopped uh, could work for a given demand. Uh, notice all the time at the bottom for idling, uh, that's where the 20% is, uh, which is uh, costing you money but not producing any compressed air. The closer you are to fully loaded, which is 100%, the more efficient the compressor is operating. Older compressors used simple electromechanical hour meters, uh, like the ones shown here on the top left. Modern controllers can show much more than hours, but uh, calculate the actual duty cycle and also provide indications about valve operations, such as the number of cycles that might be helpful when evaluating a compressor's life. As a tip here, those meters, when you look very closely on the left there, they don't last forever. So please make sure they work by observing for at least a few load cycles. Obviously, just using the numbers, like in this example, can be very misleading, as the 19,326 load hours on the right there uh, out of 99, 535 run hours is a 20% duty cycle, 
But just seeing that the two hour meters are different types makes me believe that the load hour meter was been, has been replaced at one time. I have also seen people handwritten notes there at what hours they had replaced it. So as long as both meters are working, you can take daily uh, or working shift and weekend shift readings just to see how the compressor is doing during those times. What we have just covered regarding duty cycle works for fixed speed compressors, load and unload. However, with many compressors that are out there having variable capacity controls, modulation controls, or variable frequency controls, for those units, the hours don't tell the entire story as they will be running most of the time, but you need to look at the percent capacity to determine the actual duty cycle or percent load. So if you have models resembling those pictures there uh, with just one hour meter typically for the service hours, it's likely to have a capacity control compressor. The picture on the right shows a percent capacity via an analog gauge. Since those are mostly uh, just vacuum indicators uh, be on, underneath of the inlet valve, they will show 100% uh, when they're off, but should be somewhat accurate once the compressor is up and running. A fully open inlet valve will show 100% capacity. Closed or almost closed, the dial will show close to zero or at least below 10%. On more current models that have industrial-based computer controls, which can provide a percentage of capacity digitally to determine the flow at that particular point in time, in particular variable frequency drive machines. The other types are using spiral or turn valves for capacity control, which may be harder to guess the actual flow. Just looking at uh, these uh, uh, the spring-loaded uh, lever there, uh, you will see it's not all that easy. Some of them actually do have a dial, but uh, it varies so much, so I, we didn't really have uh, too much time for pictures. We would recommend for those that you install a flow meter at the compressor discharge, as this is the best, albeit a little bit more expensive solution to get to know your system. Yeah? Compressor design always involves efficiency. There are multiple types of compressors, dynamic and positive displacement, and efficiencies are going to vary based on these designs as well as where you're operating in regard to pressure. Facility demands are different even for the same company at various locations doing the same thing. So using the same compressor in every plant just won't necessarily guarantee the same efficiency. We've showed you uh, some examples here in this graphic at right, and that shows uh, X versus Y uh, percent flow um, versus uh, percent power. And it gives you an indication uh, based on control types where you are in that percent capacity, or like Werner was talking about, uh, duty cycle for fixed speed machines, or you know where you are on the curve for those machines that can vary their output. Fixed speed compressors are significantly affected by storage volume. So the gray line that you see at the top um, that has uh, quite the curve to it and really is the most inefficient system down to about, say, 40% of total compressor capacity. But if we add significant storage volumes, then that fixed speed compressor actually gets close to the variable speed and um, the variable capacity compressor controls. So, you know, it, it really depends on where you're operating as to what is most efficient. Um, specifically speaking, if we look at 50%, you know, modulation gives way uh, in efficiency-wise uh, to pretty much everything else except for, uh, like I said before, that uh, fixed-speed compressor with very little storage. Compressed air efficiency is just like fuel efficiency. In our case, we're talking power versus flow instead of miles per gallon. And, you know, some people talk about it as flow versus power, but in generally speaking, when you look at a KGI data sheet, it's power versus flow. And it's not just the design of the compressor, but actually how it's running. You'll see the traffic light there at the bottom left. Um, and, you know, you're going to see that over and over again in the examples when we get to them. Think of it like any other traffic light. Green is good. You know, perfect, smooth sailing, everything's perfect. A yellow, not, not as good, some improvement. But red, just generally speaking, bad, you're, you're giving up you know, a lot uh, of efficiency. So the further under 25 kilowatt per 100 CFM, the more energy, um, you know, you're saving. And if you're over, uh, the more energy that you're spending. So you want to strive for that green.
Compressors are typically one of the highest power consumers in the plant, so we're trying to paint that picture here. Approximately 10% of all energy used in the United States is associated with compressors. Just like any bill that um, you know, you're paying per month, you want to make sure that you're looking at it um, and seeing what's happening. Um, if that, that demand or that, that energy is going up or the costs are going up, then is it justifiable? Is it proportional to your production? If they keep going up and there's no justification, then obviously that's something you want to consider and, and look into. Even if your efficiency is good, remember we just talked about that, under 25 uh, kilowatt per 100 CFM, that doesn't mean you're using that compressed air efficiently. And one of my favorite graphic is that pie chart there in the middle. It shows productive loads between 45 and 60 percent of overall demand. That means 40 to 55 percent of all compressed air supply could be wasted. And then there's those leaks that we talked about before, low-hanging fruit ripe for correction. Getting back to our core topic of oversized systems, generally speaking, they have higher than necessary energy costs. And when you consider that energy is over 70% of a compressor's life cycle cost, the bigger you install, the more money you'll be spending over the lifetime of your equipment, not just in energy, but also in your service costs, as well as your capital spend. Often overlooked is operating pressure. If everything's running normal, well, Perfect, great, no one talks about the compressed air system, but when things fall apart, generally we say we need more pressure. Here are two graphics that show operating pressure actually running pretty well. The graphic on the left shows pressure cycling between 105 and 115 PSI. However, what you may not know is that these particular compressors are 100 horsepower, variable frequency drive units designed to hit a target pressure and you know, ramp up and down and meeting demand. But obviously here, these units are way oversized uh, for the current demand because they're cycling for very little flow at best every 10 minutes. The graphic on the right is a little bit better, uh, actually a lot better, um, shows a 150 horsepower variable frequency drive compressor and a 75 horsepower fixed speed compressor. The pressure is very stable at about 115 PSI and the variable frequency drive compressor is trimming on top of the 75 horsepower uh, fixed speed, which is running 100% fully loaded. But we can't really ask for a better system operation. However, for every two PSI increase, we're spending an additional 1% energy. Plus, for every one PSI drop, we can drop 1% of all unregulated demands. So it really behooves us to drop the pressure as low as we possibly can go. We focus on our quest so far in an oversized system based on numbers and hard data. However, observations within the system are also key. Systems that are oversized typically are less reliable. This happens because rapid changes in pressure or unnecessarily high pressure can tax the system, resulting in low duty cycles as well as induced constant cycling. Most systems, they can persist with these traits, but once the compressor's down, that's where all these points coalesce and that's what we want to avoid. Low duty cycles and frequent compressor cycling causes wear on cycling components, particularly your valves, your inlet valve, your minimum pressure check valve. You also see this with motors because they only have so many starts per hour, plus the support uh, components like electrical components. So constant starting and stopping of motors not only shortens the motor's lifetime, but can also cause premature failure of these electrical components. Think of it this way, everything that you use has only so many cycles before they need to be repaired or replaced. Further, thermal cycling can cause damage to coolers because of constant temperature changes from high to low. You can see that cold spot there in the middle of the thermal image at the bottom right. And that's that black area. So thermal cycling they can also cause shortened or um, shortened lubricant life as well. Air compressors that spend too much time in idle or off position, they're going to drop temperatures. And the higher the temperature, the more water can be entrained in the air. For every 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature drop in operating uh, temperature, 50% of the water vapor is going to drop out. That means you'll potentially have a lot of water mixed in with your lubricant for stagnant compressors. This can cause rusting of the compressor element or, as we say, errand, 
and can cause a catastrophic failure, as we'll see later in some of the pictures. We focused on five measurables for the compressed air station to this point to help determine if the system's oversized, but you can also see the effects of an oversized system on the production floor. Inconsistent pressures at the point of use can result in high scrap rates and can cause equipment malfunction or shutdown, leading to production downtime. Further, unplanned shutdowns from an oversized compressor can cause plant downtime or lost productivity. Keep in mind that the average cost of industrial downtime is about $30,000 per hour, and it, it, you know, it could be significantly higher for you uh, or for your customers. Okay, so how does this happen? You know, we've laid the groundwork, but how do we get there? The reasons, they, they vary widely. Most systems are innocently oversized. Many times you see this as a green field. The plant only exists on paper, and we're building it from the ground up. Um, you know, hence the term greenfield. No one really knows what the plant will actually operate at, and there's probably a lot of cooks in the kitchen, and everybody's add, adding a fudge factor. Sometimes plants could reduce production levels due to current economic factors, like the time we find ourselves in today with the coronavirus. Or we change production equipment that simply uses less compressed air, leaving us with an oversized uh, compressed air system. We could also identify some huge leaks, and that can further reduce demand. Or we size the system for everything running at the same time, but that never comes to fruition. Expansions are really one of my most interesting topics. Uh, it involves you know, a lot of different people, allows everybody to shine, and many times we see that the plan for a big expansion but we never quite get there, and that can leave us oversized as well. In the end, just because your system's working doesn't mean that it's working well. All right, here's a great example. So, hi, Werner. It's always good to talk with you. I've got a lot of things going on, but uh, right now I need a quote for a 100-horsepower compressor. And this would be Werner. And so as a salesperson, this can go all different kinds, but as a salesperson, I'm smiling on the inside. I'm thinking about the bonus of selling a large compressor, and I will reply, sure, when do you need it? The previous example is just one of many reasons why we're ending up in the oversizing dilemma. We have focused on observations and simple measurements of a compressor station to this point, things you might be able to pull easily for metrics already in your system. As the saying goes, if you can measure it, you can manage it. If we don't measure and analyze what we have, then we can set ourselves up for failure down the road. One of my favorite responses to any question is why? Why do you want to know? What's the reasoning behind your question, etc.? Failure to question why, why we have done things the way we have, may not be detrimental, but it can leave a lot of improvement and innovation and also money on the table. The best way to succeed with improving your compressed air station is to set up a baseline measurement by doing an air system audit. Another improvement would be to continuously monitor your compressed air station, keeping a good handle on your maintenance schedule and cost, as well as document any emergency breakdowns. Quarterly or even monthly or weekly reviews of that data will eventually provide the insight needed. This monitoring and even reporting is yet another feature that shows up in more of the modern master controllers that are available today. So an air audit, typically a one-time measurement stretched over a few days, time period, sometimes up to two weeks, followed up by an analysis of your compressed air system or the data that has been recorded. This can be as simple as just pressure and flow out of the compressor's room all the way to a full-blown energy audit, including measurement of multiple pressures, flows, KW, or even air quality, and all of that recorded over this one or two-week time period to get it started. There have been many webinars, white papers, articles written about audits, the system, as Neil mentioned earlier, or even the individual um, specific power and even individual compressors, including part load performance and or cycling frequency that follow the flow and pressure profile. 
Reviewing alarm and message history, as you see on the bottom left, can assist in reliability assessments and possibly pinpoint specific trouble areas. This example on the left shows a gross oversizing and or control issue. The green area showing the load or productive time and the rather large yellow areas is the waste of operating a fixed speed machine or multiples in that case in the non-productive idle mode. Large pressure swings are also signs of a possible control gap due to incorrect sizing or oversizing, sometimes forcing a 100 horsepower compressor to do a 5 or 10 horsepower job. The goal is to see as much green as possible, we'll have some examples later, and keep the trim losses to minimum, resulting in low specific power performance values. On the right side, we can watch how a master controller can actually adjust the operating pressure. When you look in the left section of the graph and then the right section, you will see that the pressure is completely different and therefore influence the running and in particular off time of the trim compressors by being flexible rather than following a fixed pressure band. Neil? Well, we've covered a lot of ground at this point and we're getting ready for our lightning round of data analysis, but before we get there, let's review our goals and how to achieve them. Now, first, duty cycle, we want to get as close to 100% as possible. Specific power, remember, we want to be in the green, under 25 kilowatt per 100 CFM, and really as low as possible. Reduce energy consumption, um, reducing operating pressure to that lowest point possible, normally called the scream point, meaning people start screaming if you go below it. Maintain healthy compressor operating temperatures. Keep your compressor running warm so you don't see thermal cycling and water sitting in your unit. All these are going to reduce your mean time between failure and mean time between repair. So how can you accomplish these goals? First, look at increasing your pressure band. This can help with your duty cycle as well as avoid rapid cycling of your compressor. Turning off the system, anytime you don't need air, this is going to reduce energy consumption. Increasing storage, this will also help with your duty cycle and help maintain operating temperatures as well as avoid any rapid cycling. Increasing system piping, that can help reduce overall system pressure by addressing any unnecessary pressure drop. You should have at least, I'm sorry, at most a 10% pressure drop between your compressor discharge and your point of use piping, assuming that's unregulated. Reducing leaks always reduces energy consumption. And finally, you know, if you're looking to make a next step, adding a master controller can help reduce your overall specific power by selecting the best combination of existing equipment and running the plant and therefore all your compressors at the lowest pressure possible. You could also consider adding or replacing equipment. So compressors, they continue to undergo efficiency improvements year after year, and therefore efficiency gains can be seen just by replacing compressors. However, if you take the core compressed air system that you have and you add maybe one trim compressor or two trim compressors or a variable frequency drive compressor along with a master controller, maybe some storage, you might be able to make significant system improvements. Now that we've covered the basics and given a brief review, let's discuss an in-depth case study with a greenfield recycling facility. For this station, there were multiple partners involved, an engineering firm, general contractor, equipment manufacturer, the end user, and of course, a compressed air supplier. The design phase covered several years as well. The parameters were simple, and like Werner talked about earlier, the most important things when sizing a system are flow and pressure. So for this system, we were looking at a peak demand of 4,000 CFM at 100 PSI. That's a pretty big system. Air quality was defined as refrigeration air quality, so roughly 40 degree pressure dew point. And the principles of design group had also identified, hey, we want at least one variable frequency drive compressor, and we would like to have a, a master controller. Big job, could be designed from the ground up, 
lots of space to work with. Well, you know, at least at first until the compressor room started to get moved, you know, down the road and maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit smaller. You know, getting the necessary power for this system could be done up front. So, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, the plant not having enough power to feed, you know, what we were trying to do later on. Um, so, you know, lots of positives here. In the end, the customer purchased one 300 horsepower VFD compressor along with four 200 horsepower fixed speed compressors with one as a backup. They also employed a master controller as well as a six inch aluminum distribution piping, which was amply sized. And, you know, the design met the air quality requirement. So everything looked great on paper. Like most greenfield systems, startup is usually phased in. After three months of operation, you can see uh, the typical flow profile here on the right-hand graphic. Um, and this graphic is 24 hours um, for multiple days. And so you can see from midnight uh, to midnight what the demand profile is. Um, the average flow during the off shift is you know, between zero and 50, so I give that a 25 CFM average. And the typical demands are between 5 a.m. and 1 p.m. You know, without looking at this hard data, it, it's hard to get the information that we just talked about. Um, you know, since this station had a modern master, uh, continuous monitoring is really easy, and we can fill in the blanks via the points we discussed earlier. Keep in mind that we chose this case study because it's oversized. However, these review points, they can be used on any system. And of course, they aren't the only things we need to consider when evaluating a station. Certainly, the compressed air station can provide enough air to the system, no question. But overall, the duty cycle on the fixed speed compressors was less than 20%. And the VFD was only 25 In the VFD, we want to be ramping up and down you know, within its set design phase. Um, you know, so it'd be percent capacity versus a duty cycle. So, you know, even that we're we're very low. You know, again, we want to make sure that we're as close to 100% duty cycle as we possibly can. So, we could see some moisture issues within these units before long if we continue with these low duty cycles, or perhaps some other mechanical issues such as valves or coolers. Changing gears a little bit. Efficiency-wise, we're really fantastic. Uh, we're in the green. We're under 25 kilowatt per 100 CFM. Energy-wise, we're even better. Uh, it's only $20,000 per year to operate. And, you know, the system is running on the nights and weekends, so maybe we could save some money there. But, you know, overall, the system looks really quite good. Possible improvements, you know, like I just mentioned, um, turning the system off nights and weekends, this could further reduce overall energy cost and most likely would improve specific power. Um, doing so will also increase the duty cycle. So we're getting closer, but not nearly close enough to 100% duty cycle. Uh, with a system as large as this one, you know, I would expect that the overall energy spend would be close to $200,000 a year in energy cost, but we're seeing 10% of that now. So we're definitely saving money there, but the fact is, that the system has five compressors with 1,100 horsepower available, with, of course, one as a backup. Um, but when it probably only needed three compressors, including a backup, so at half the horsepower, reducing the compressor size at this point isn't most likely going to give much energy savings. But the maintenance savings could be several fold. Plus, that capital spend was significantly higher, most likely double what was needed. So even though in general electricity is the biggest part of the life cycle cost, for this example it's significantly less. We've got some more typical stations to discuss in the next examples, so on to you Werner. So how do you get to know your system? Air audits or permanent online monitoring data? That is, seems to be really the way to go here. So let's take a look at what information we gain and how it is being used in designing, sizing, and optimizing a system. Here we are looking at the flow measurement results. This is the left graph here, similar to what uh, Neil was showing, 24-hour uh, period. It results, basically it was a two-week uh, air audit of that station, it's a single compressor station. 
A quick look reveals that the customer is shutting the unit off during non-production hours. Uh, that's a bonus point. As soon as seen on the left graph, uh, the maximum flow unfortunately was only 149 out of 236 CFM. On the right, we are looking at a histogram of how much time this compressor spent providing specific flow ranges. The result of the graph, you can easily, with one glance, identify that the duty cycle for this compressor ranges somewhere between 10 and 55 percent, resulting in a specific power in the yellow area, or upper yellow area, and at 50 percent, reaching basically the maximum cycles per hour. Not a good thing. Here is yet another single 50 horsepower system running 24-7. The top right shows the histogram, again, of the demand. Duty cycle 40 to 50 percent, pretty steady, uh, which means we are at about the maximum cycle rate, similar to the before. This looks like a candidate for a variable speed drive compressor, and when calculating the numbers, that showed about a 38 percent gain in specific power, and in this case, about 4,000 dollars savings per year. Going up in size, here we are looking at two 100 horsepower fixed speed compressors totaling about 988 CFM for well, that system. So let's take a look at this low distribution on the right. Well, this one is all over the place, ranging from 10% to about 90% of the total system. It's not bad at all. Starting, uh, sporting a specific power that is already in the green, thanks to ample storage in the system and splitting the load. Being a very popular size, it's no surprise that we are again looking at a 50 horsepower compressor with an adequately sized 660 gallon receiver tank capacity operating here 40 to 60 percent. For a single compressor with adequate storage, this creates moderate cycling. We will show a more detailed graph also later for that. But uh, in this case, two smaller units could save the customer about 15% of his uh, energy cost. So here we are looking at a single variable speed drive compressor with about 647 CFM maximum flow. Uh, for this 13-day profile, we show an operation at 24-7 all around, running at a very nice duty cycle in between 60 to 92%. And this just looks about right. Recommendation here, this is a well operating system, so perhaps a newer model or more modern variable speed drive compressor that has improved efficiency. This 100 horsepower compressor system, again, seems to be a very popular choice, like we did also in the phone call. So here we go with two 100 horsepower. In this case, one of them is a backup, rated at 560 CFM each. Only a 500 gallon tank for this rather large system, refrigerated dryer, filters, that's uh, the compressed air system shown on the top right there. The demand and pressure profile is for about nine days of normal operation. As you can see, they do not shown, shut down the system. However, when you look very closely, you can see that the maximum flow over the entire period for the day measured was only about 144 CFM rated 560 each. Running the calculation for this system, replacing it with two 20 horsepower units, they would do the job just perfectly, providing a 64% energy reduction over the, uh, the current installation. So this is what you can read out of that. And here's that promised uh, chart about what it does. Looking at that particular compressor before, at the 100 horsepower, providing only 90 CFM for this 100 horsepower compressor, causes it to uh, have an eight and a half second load cycle and a 37 second unload cycle, and the unit will never ever stop. This produces a huge number of service hours for this rather large compressor, which costs money, along with more than 80 cycles per hour, about 700,000 cycles per year, and let's just call it a maintenance challenge. Okay, enough of this. Uh, as Neil mentioned, we did thousands of those air studies, and the examples we just showed you here 
are quite representative of what's going on out there when things are not working out well, except for the two examples which I showed you, uh, which are working fine. The reliability, along with high energy and service costs, are causes of concern for both the customers and the sales process. So, how do we go about designing a system after review of an audit? So let's take this example here. This is a three-shift operation with the various average flow requirements of 550, 320, and 150 CFM for these three shifts. So certainly this pie can be sliced in several different ways. You can choose, like this uh, phone call, just one large compressor, which then also requires a similar or identical sized large backup compressor covering the main shift very well, but oversized for the rest of the uh, shifts. You can split it with two evenly sized compressors, which allows for a smaller single backup unit, and you're operating two out of three. You can choose a mix of two smaller trim compressors and one larger base load compressor with one base load as a backup unit. That's the line item three. Or at the very end, to show just uh, the incorporation of a variable frequency drive trim machine and several equal or different sized fixed speed machines, the smaller backup unit, again, being a benefit in terms of uh, purchasing cost, including master controller to optimize the selection of which unit should be operating, allowing for the optimal reduction in idle times. So by the way, the numbers on the right are based on our experience in analyzing such systems. So this is not just something we made up here. Here's a quick look at what reduced idle time together with a modern master controller can do. Uh, on the top, you see that it's the same compressor cycling on and off, sometimes stopping, sometimes not. And this is not just for the energy, but also to reduce the total running and service hours of your compressor. So what does this uh, master controller do? It will switch back and forth between compressor one and compressor two. And having those multiple compress compressors as a choice for the switching, uh, you can actually be turning them off faster and therefore saving idle time or also called the uh, cycle energy and maintenance hours. So this is just one of the tricks of a master controller having split systems. So here's an example, real life example. We just took the screenshots of the master controller. Uh, three identical 100 horsepower compressors with modern controllers looking at the layout on the left the pressure, flow, and cycling graph in the center, and also a little bit more details on the pressure and cycling at the top right. So there are two items to point out of this control system. A, picking different compressors that are pretty much only running fully loaded or at least with reduced cycle losses, which reduces the service hours as well as the energy cost, and B, using a variable pressure range to control these compressors during different levels of demand. So the old keep a very tight pressure band no matter what, that is out of the window. Last up but least, we need to look at the uh, solution for trim compressor. So what about the difference here between fixed speed and variable speed trim compressor? The top graph shows the start idle and shut off losses in red for the fixed speed cycling compressor in a single variable speed control compressor at the bottom, which must regulate over its entire range and thereby covers its inefficient ranges as well. It can happen that the unit runs longer in the lower speed range and therefore becomes inefficient as it also constantly has to carry errand and variable frequency drive losses, which are shown here in yellow and red at the lower screen. We use a virtual, we at Kaiser, we use a virtual compressor simulation for best uh, solution, uh, not just by simply observing and going with the gut feeling, we actually crunch the numbers. The system air consumption is required for such a calculation. 
Uh, if we don't have nothing at all, we can create a, a, a profile, but we prefer to certainly have a existing profile, maybe even from a sister company. Designing single compressor stations should be avoided as they always have significant losses, regardless of speed control or switching operation. Both control systems can lead to the units not reaching their proper operating temperatures. Uh, as uh, Neil mentioned earlier, now, running the risk of uh, thermal, running in thermal ranges that you don't want to operate and producing condensate in the oil. These points should all be reviewed during a system design stage. Another comment on the variable speed compressor. As you can see here, this is a curve from a KGI data sheet. Even the variable speed drive compressor has areas you really do not want to operate in for a long time. Typically on the low end, this is the red area marked in the left graph. Uh, these curves will change by manufacturer and type of compressor, so they're not uh, always the same. Variable frequency drive units are designed for 24 seven operation at full load. So the cooling system is designed for those extreme conditions. So on the example on the right, uh, I think Neil showed the curve earlier, but I picked just one 25% spot here. That will run at a very low power and therefore produce low amounts of heat. It does not take much to make some of these units run at these too cold of oil temperatures. This is uh, two variable frequency drive machines. This is the report for that system. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, on the top right there, all you want to see is green. So with a variable frequency drive machine, it's all green. We don't have any idle there. And the center picture where the red line goes up and down a little bit to the right, it shows you on how smoothly a master controller can make the transition from one machine to the next machine without really any hiccup in the pressure or supply of compressed air. Let's take a different point of view on this topic of oversizing. Why in the world would a manufacturer of compressors be concerned about customers buying larger compressors? So over the past decade or more, there was a lot of information put out about saving energy with compressors that included inappropriate uses, leaks, overpressurizing controls, etc. Today, we're going pretty much in a similar direction. So the question is, how can compressed air users save time, money, and stress with their compressed air system? And the answer is reducing the total life cycle cost by properly sizing and controlling your compressed air system. Neil? Yeah, so remember those key metrics we discussed earlier, duty cycle, specific power, energy, and pressure. Continuously monitor those items, as well as keep up with your compressor maintenance and schedule. And note, you may need to accelerate some service if your system is oversized. Whenever you have the opportunity to improve the station, use these best practices that we discussed and design flexibility into your system. Those are not pretty sights here, but uh, let's just take it in at some of these visuals on issues that may be the result of oversizing. We're talking about condensate, water, rust inside the oil circuit. We're talking about uh, rust and crud inside the entire compressor condensation. Coolers that are dying under thermal stress. Excessive wear on valves causing them to stick, and then therefore causing further distress. Motor issues due to increased starting, stopping, in particular when you have direct online uh, operations. So overall, oversizing does nothing to improve reliability, just the opposite. And you know, here is one uh, possible outcome that we all want to avoid. A compressor with a locked up Aaron with a motor burnout and really no economical repair for such an old compressor. Remember this conversation from earlier on? So, you know, what do you think now about having this telephone call? What should actually be happening? Hello, Werner? Well, <laughs> there are certainly several different scenarios for this call, and, and it also depends whether you're calling an engineering office or a compressed air consultant or a salesperson. So here's, i give you just one example. Note here in this picture that the customer is no longer demanding a specific solution, but he's rather asking for advice, as well as the offer of assistance from both sides to work together and on site to find a good solution. 
So what will your call look like in the future? Please think about it on both sides of the telephone. So at the end here, we trust that we could provide some helpful tips about quick assessments, moving on to an air audit to take a closer look, and then use proper system design and controls to plan for a more reliable and economical compressed air system future. Back to you, Tom. All right. Thank you, Werner, and thank you, Neil, for that presentation. I think we have time for two questions, um, and we'll get right to them since we only have about seven minutes left. Um, I'll hit the two that seem to most pinpoint the issues you brought up in this presentation, guys. And the first one is simple. How do I tell if my system is oversized? Look at the hour meters percent load gauges, doing a quick audit, uh, watch for large pressure swings, rapid cycling, look at capacity gauges, uh, just sometimes just hooking up one fl uh, flow meter, which nowadays are inexpensive. So, But don't forget to also look at doing the off times, which is weekends, off seasons, for example, food processing when they uh, harvest the product. You know, well, don't just go by this maximum. Also have a solution for the off season when you're just basically canning the tomatoes rather than processing them. So that would be one answer for me. Yeah, I think you covered pretty much everything. I think, you know, in a lot of cases, um, you may be seeing something going on downstream and you may not be going into the compressor room. So I think, you know, Werner pretty much hit it on the head. You you got to know what's going on with your equipment. you got to open the doors of the compressor room and or if you're continuously monitoring, you'll be able to see those key points that we talked about earlier. Okay. Well, and the second question is a convert to this first question, which is what are some of the ways, maybe even the simplest ways, for me to overcome an oversight system? I mean, is there any low-hanging fruit that is common to sort of all oversized systems that people can tackle right away? You, know, you want to look at what mm -hmm. your pressure profile is. Um, you know, if, if Typically speaking, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, compressors will be set for maybe a seven-pound differential between load and load. That might be too small, um, especially if you have a high pressure drop through your air treatment equipment and, you know, a seven-pound pressure differential for your compressor is only, you know, ending up being a one-pound differential for the unit. So as soon as that machine unloads, it's reloading again. So, you know, you really want to make sure that your differential is as wide as possible. I'd make sure that, um, you know, your throughput, your piping uh, from your compressor to, you know, anywhere inside of your compressor room is big enough. Um, and you can check the velocity charts for that as well. But pressure drop across air treatment uh, will could really wreak havoc on uh, on that system. So those are the things that you know I would say potential improvements for your existing machine um, that I would consider. Well, I got two more. Uh, increased storage seems to be one simple solution, and l verify and adjust the controls that you have if you have multiple uh, compressors. Uh, Neil mentioned spreading the delta P, but uh, if you have multiple, then certainly also consider a master controller, and those are just the uh, two extra points on this one. Okay. Well, I think that brings us to about time. First things, Neil Werner, I love working with, with you both. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tom. Always good to talk with you. Well, thank you, Tom, and all the listeners. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to listen to us talk here. Thank you. Well, and, and I'll echo that thanks to our listeners. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available with the full audio shortly for on-demand viewing. And we'll get that link out to everybody uh, as soon as we can. Um, everyone's also encouraged to visit plantservices.com to gain access to even more tools and resources aimed at helping you achieve success. And once again, if I can direct your attention to the handout section, it's at lower left. Um, the full set of speaker slides from Werner and Neil's presentation today are available uh, for download right now and will remain available for anyone viewing on demand. Plus, there's an article that was just published in our May issue of Planet Services by Kaiser's Michael Camber titled, Too Big to Succeed, Is Excess Capacity Dragging Down the Performance of Your Compressed Air System? If so, here's how to right size. Did you like this presentation? Please let us know your thoughts by answering a brief survey that will appear on your screen shortly. Your candid answers are not only appreciated, they do help us craft future and better events. So once again, thanks to our sponsor, Kaiser Compressors. Thanks to Neil and Werner for presenting today. And thanks to everyone who was with us. Have a great rest of the day.